Welcome to this episode of Georgia Detours. I'm Allie Hill. Downtown Atlanta is a hub for restaurants of all kinds, but along with the convenience of having so much excitement in one place comes Atlanta's notoriously difficult traffic. Driving and parking in Atlanta can be an overwhelming experience, so we've drawn up an itinerary where you can enjoy all the benefits of delicious downtown dining without the stress of navigating the roads. Today, we're taking you to three of our favorite dining spots for lunch, dessert, and drinks all within just a few blocks of one another. Rubens is a New York style deli that has been serving Atlanta since 1996. But in 2001, the restaurant changed hands and has been owned and operated by Mr. Claudio Fergiel ever since. Claudio was born in Argentina, but fled with his family from the fascist government in 1964 when he was just four years old. He grew up in New York City, where he cultivated his passion for cooking from a very young age. My dad was opposing the fascist regime, and so he was marching against them, and then they came looking for him, and that was in June. And then in August, he came to the United States, and then my mother and I followed January 31st of 64. Nelson Rockefeller was our sponsor, so we went to New York. My dad was very well connected in terms of things that went on in the dock, so the people I hung out with were like my uncle, Lou Costello, I see Joe, the barber who didn't have a barber shop. These were the people that my parents hung out with. So on Fridays, we would go to my uncle Lou's house in Flushing, and the, the men and the women would have dinner together, and then uh, they would be dancing in the living room. Right after the, the dancing stopped, the women would be ushered into the kitchen, and the men would talk business in the living room while smoking cigars. I got into cooking because I found that the the men would be talking business and smoking cigars and it was a little stinky and the women were all in the kitchen and I much enjoyed the company of the women that I did with the men so I would hang out with neighbors and this and that whoever came into the kitchen so I learned how to cook. My background is French cuisine. I'm trained as a French pastry chef. That is how I started in the business. I was a sous chef in a French restaurant in Santa Barbara. I cooked for Ronald Reagan and Queen Elizabeth. I was the chef at the top of the town in Cleveland, and then the James Tavern and the Cheese Cellar. That was voted one of the top 50 restaurants in the country. I got to Atlanta because I was working for a company in North Carolina. I had six restaurants, and I was leaving my house at, on Mondays, and I got home on Thursday nights. Had a heart attack in 97, and about a year later, I resigned as vice president, but you were like vice president, area director, cook, you did everything. I had a friend who was president of Longhorn, and they were starting a new concept, and so he asked me if I would come down to Atlanta, open up the new concept for him, and then become the regional vice president for him. So I did all that, except I didn't accept the position. I got fired, I couldn't find a job, and so I looked at buying a restaurant. I work better fixing problems than working from a blank slate, so I felt that it would be much easier for me and my personality to find a location and fix it. So I realized what location I wanted here. I found a restaurant that was available, and then at the end of 2001, I bought the restaurant. My plan was to have the restaurant for five years and then I would sell the property. So I left it with the name that it had and we slowly changed Rubens to what it is today from what it was. There's a lot of owners that walk in, smoke a cigarette and point fingers, you know, kind of do owner stuff. I like the work. I mean, I have one restaurant because I like working. I like being a part of the team. I think that is part of what makes this restaurant successful. Claudio infuses his expertise of flavor combinations in almost every item on Ruben's menu. Sandwiches, sides, and even condiments are scratch made with only the best ingredients. New York Deli is fresh meat, cut for you fresh, it's fresh bread, it's a big sandwich and it's a fair price. The Reuben sandwich was voted the number one Reuben on Yelp. 
It was voted one of the top Rubens in the country by Yahoo. The corned beef is my recipe. I do not make it in-house because I don't have the square footage to go through the 300 and some odd pounds that we go through a week of just corned beefs. So because of the volume that we buy, there is a manufacturer out of New Jersey that I worked with to put together the, the profile, the flavor of it, and then they make it for me because of my volume. It's all about flavor and flavor profile. What you're doing is you're taking the herbs, spices, and you're combining it to make something. Way back when, we used Ken's Italian dressing. Ah, I'm not gonna do that. So I decided to make an Italian dressing. It, it's really good. Uh, we make our own mayos because you try other stuff and you go, you know what, that's good. I think I can make it better. And it is, I think. We make all our own side items, macaroni, potato, coleslaw, pasta salad, broccoli salad, the chicken salad from here we make the tuna. So I mean everything, basically everything that you see we make here and what we don't make here, it's really obvious we don't make it here. But the thing is if you're gonna cook at home, you're not gonna open up a can and drop it on a plate and go, go ahead and eat. If you're inviting people over for dinner, you're going to make pasta or you're going to buy the best pasta. You're going to make a sauce. The restaurants really should be no different. Part of what creates, or part of what makes a New York deli is that the people that come into it are, are neighbors. They're, they're not just customers. A lot of restaurants that people go to, it's just they could care less whether you come in or not. It's different when it's neighbors and family. Now it's personal. Not only the food, but also the attitude at Rubens is reminiscent of a classic New York deli. Here, you find big sandwiches with big flavor served to you by big personalities. When you come in, don't be surprised by their sarcastic wit and loud greetings. They're just treating you like part of the family. We saw a lot of sandwiches. Today we'll probably see about four to 600 people. 67% of the people that walk in here are regulars. One nice thing about my restaurant is I have four or five employees that when they see you, they'll remember something about you, your hair, your glasses, and they'll remember you coming back in. We get a lot of people that say, you know, make me the sandwich you made me last time. It's like, I mean, it's, that's crazy. But we do, because of how we structure the ordering. Most restaurants, you walk to a person, they stare at you, you go, I'll take a number one and size it up, and they go. And that's it, that's the interaction. This is a full contact deli. There's a lot of people in here. You gotta be loud. You, you, you've gotta know what you want, because otherwise I will give you what I want. And you have to be ready to understand what to add on to the sandwich. If I get a bad review because the sandwich is bad, because you put garbage on it, now that's a you problem now. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to steer you in the right direction. I had a guy come in this morning and he says, you know what I like about this place? When I'm getting ready to ruin my sandwich, you guys set me straight. The menu at Rubens is amazing as is. But if you're hungry for something specific, Claudio and his team will make you just about anything you ask for. Oh, and you may want to check out Ruben's Facebook page before you visit and get familiar with their secret menu too, just in case something there strikes your fancy. So we have like six or seven items on our secret menu. I post it on Facebook on a regular basis because there's always somebody who goes, oh, secret menu, you have a And some of it's kind of crazy. It's like, why would I ever eat that? And things like the Old Tuesday which is a special we had about 15 years ago, which is the, the fresh baked ciabatta bread, pepperoni, capicola, hickory turkey, and provolone cheese. Some guy decided that's what he wanted, and so, okay, I got the stuff here, I'll make it. It builds community, it builds neighborhood when you feel like, like we really care about you, and we do. So if you said to me, look, you know what, I, I, I really would like to have a grilled chicken burrito, okay? Just tell me what you're hungry for. We can make something for you. The law students from Georgia State uh, come in on Friday and they get what's called Afternoon Delight. It's a cheesecake and an and oatmeal raisin cookie. In a, uh, so I had to buy a blender for them. In a blender with a little bit of milk. And it is, it is out of this world. The, the cool thing about the students coming in here is that 
We've been here such a long time. I think that the greatest compliment we ever got was from a student telling us that we're an institution. That's a great compliment. But you've got guys that have come here. In fact, there's one guy that specifically came here. There was one seat open. And so I had a girl sitting next to him. Do you mind if she sits with you? Now, they're married now. They have two kids and they come back on a regular basis. Food is all about family for Claudio. Not only because his daughter works alongside him in the restaurant, he treats his other employees like family too. And he cares about the customers with the same sentiment. Claudio wants Rubens to be a place where you sit down with friends and family, slow down a little, and really enjoy the food and each other. It really is a family. Stanley's been here 16 years, 17 years. High has been here five or six. It's more than just sustenance. I mean, I grew up where you would have a big table, a whole bunch of food, and eating was an event. I think that's where my generation lost it, is that it became so important for me and my wife to work and work hard. I mean, and for all the good reasons, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like, oh, the heck with the kids. We don't like them anymore. I mean, to give our kids a better life, we lost sight of where the ball really was. Sitting down and having dinner with the family. Uh, last night, we had dinner on my back deck with my wife and I, my, my daughters, and my two grandkids. The things that the kids will remember will be sitting outside having dinner. I mean, they probably can't remember what they ate, but the fact that we had that time together, and I think we really lost that. And hopefully, the restaurant and the food brings that back. Dang, those sandwiches look so delicious. After all that protein, your sweet tooth is probably kicking in. Let's head to our next stop, King of Pops. Whether your taste in popsicles is traditional or maybe a little bit more avant-garde, you're sure to enjoy one of their unique flavors. King of Pops' main headquarters is in the Inman Park neighborhood of Atlanta, but it's not uncommon to see their street vendors stationed all over the city. I love working here. We started a few years ago and we just have some really good core values that we you know, live by and we try to um, exemplify those core values every day when we're working and being thoughtful towards each other and to, towards the environment as well. A lot of our flagship flavors, which um, our chocolate sea salt is probably our most popular popsicle, um, also the strawberry lemonade as well, but we're well known for our funky flavors, so things like pineapple habanero, um, it's a, a popsicle made with fresh pineapple and then we just do a little bit of habanero so it is a little spicy. People seek out grapefruit mint. We also have a blackberry ginger lemonade as well. Here at the window we have pops for three dollars. We also have dog ice cream as well. So we have small and large dog ice cream so those are two and three dollars. Steven and Nick started the company a couple years ago and they're here every single day working really hard so you know sometimes they're traveling but most of the time they're sitting right here beside us working. On a trip through Central America, the Karst brothers enjoyed tasty fresh fruit ice pops known as paletas. And it was then that the idea of King of Pops was born. After losing his job as a product analyst at AIG, Stephen Karst decided it was time to turn his dreams of starting a popsicle company into a reality. Shortly thereafter, Stephen's brother Nick left his job as a prosecutor and joined the new family business. And it is booming! The secret to their success is in their fresh ingredients and quirky flavor combos. We always have to push people for new pop creations, otherwise we get stuck in a rut. I mean, basically, basically what we do to come up with our flavors is it's what's available from our farmers and from our suppliers. We look at what else we have on the shelf, whether it's spices or herbs or other fruits or whatever, and um, then just go from there. If we see something that we want to try, we just try it. Because generally we've found that our customers are pretty adventurous, and so we've made like avocado popsicles, we've made like um, carrot popsicles, we made spinach popsicles. Every bar has one, they're just uh, I don't citrus, know, press. citrus press. 
Yeah. And then last, over the winter, we purchased this, the Juice Tree 900. Pretty cool. So we, we were in a shared kitchen last year that was probably a fifth of the size of this yeah, one, I'd say. the size of this. So, so we don't tiny. necessarily need all this space, but it makes it a lot easier. all year round in some of our uh, locations like Whole Foods or Earth Fair, but our busiest months that we're out in the carts is about March to basically October, November. Those popsicles are sure to give you the sugar rush you need for the rest of your night. When you're ready to wind down with a drink after a long and food-filled day, step into Sidebar on Poplar Street. The laid-back atmosphere in the local dive bar truly makes you feel like you're in a place where everybody knows your name. This bar has everything you can ask for. Let's take a look. Sidebar is originally has kind of like a few different meanings. The reason why we're called Sidebar is because, first of all, it's a courthouse term and we're right across the street from the district courthouse. A sidebar means like a meeting, so we thought that was cool. But also, when we originally opened, we subleased from the club. The club had the street entrance. Our entrance was on the side of the building, in that alley. You came in on the side, and then in the original area of sidebar, the bar was all on one side of the place. So that's kind of the three reasons why we called it sidebar. But going back to that alley, we had a long negotiation with uh, the Georgia State Fire Marshal on that alley because it was our only entrance. The alley is kind of a shared uh, easement. It's actually technically owned by Georgia Power, but you know Georgia State uses it. We, this building uses it. It's the fire exit for the Rialto. So we actually were out there and we had to like draw a big yellow line down the middle of the alley and any, and the agreement was with the Georgia State Fire Marshal was any furniture tables we have have to be inside that line. So, but that was like a really long contention even at, at, at opening. And so we put the string lights up there and it's used in a lot of, a lot of filming actually. Hollywood productions, uh, TV shows, you'll, you'll see a, quite a lot of that alley in, in there if you know where to look. So some of the things that we've, uh, we've had filming here, especially in the alley, is the upcoming Spider-Man movie, Baby Driver, Killing Reagan, The Night Before with Seth Rogen, and a lot of others. The lo a lot of locations, people pick us, and they pick downtown Atlanta, and particularly our area and our alley, because it does look like New York, pretty much. In the last year, it's blown up as far as how many productions come to Atlanta and you know even interact with us and, and use us as a location and we, we I mean we actually get a lot of people from uh, the tabernacle the tabernacle guys the people that work at the tabernacle if if some of the talent is looking to go out at a local place where they're not going to get made a big deal of and I kind of like train our people like hey if someone star comes in here don't like go gaga just treat them like normal because if they're coming here that's pretty much what they want so we kind of say that sidebar is the bar that we wanted when we were in our late 20s. The concept, if you want to call it, is classic and timeless. It's a neighborhood bar. We'll change this beer or that beer, and you know, we'll add a menu item here and take one away, but I don't think you'll ever come in here and not get a Cuban sandwich, wings, or you know, a Bud Light. So Quickie is originally from high school wrestling, but it was never kind of used. Uh, like Everyone on the team had a nickname, and I was Quickie Koala, and I had like big, Afro hair, and when I wore the headgear, my stuck out like a koala bear. Fast forward, like to like at University of Florida, I joined a fraternity. One of the first nights, they say, "Hey, you have any, you know, finding any dirt on you?" And they say, "Do you have any nicknames?" I said, "Quickie Koala." I woke up the next morning, I was Quickie ever since. Even at, you know, a lot of people even at CNN knew me outside of CNN knew like I went by Quickie. I didn't like on the CNN newsroom floor. I didn't really go by Quickie as much, but but when I joined, when I opened the restaurant. I sort of regained that full out personality. And there's a lot of people, some people, even employees I have, that someone will call here asking for Matt. And they're like, oh, I don't know like Matt's. <laughs> Jose is from a Cuban background, so a lot of our stuff has a, a Cuban, uh, with Cuban sandwiches, black beans and rice. And then we take like 
kind of like Americanized stuff like chicken fingers and hot wing sauce and make that on a Cuban style sandwich. So our Red Falcon is chicken tenders tossed in buffalo sauce with cheddar cheese pressed in a, on a Cuban sandwich. So we kind of take those kind of things and make a menu out of like a very small kitchen. At Sidebar, the, the most popular items are the Cuban sandwich, the wings, and the Red Falcon sandwich. So our Cuban sandwich is our actual real signature dish. We home roast our pork. It's just like you're gonna get, it, get on Cayocha on Miami. We source local Cuban bread and roast our pork, and it's made with ham and mustard and three pickle slices and toasted up crispy and, and hot so the cheese is melted, and that's definitely our signature, signature item. Our wings are, we just have a classic hot wing recipe uh, that's just great. And so we have hot, lemon pepper, barbecue, and then quickie sauce. Man, sometimes people don't know who I am, and they'll come in, They'll come up, they'll be like, like, hi, I'm Quickie. I'm like, oh, Quickie sauce. I love Quickie sauce. So Quickie sauce is a combination of hot and then honey garlic. So we take our, our, hot, our hot sauce and then mix in honey and garlic in there. And people really like it. Ask anybody, they'll tell you that we have the best wings pretty much in downtown. The design was just kind of me and Jose saying, what's here, what looks good, and what can we kind of use to make it feel in the feeling that we wanted. So as I said, we really wanted like a kind of city bar, a place that's casual, but that everyone's gonna feel welcome in. And so we pretty much took the architecture that was there and then kind of uh, amended it to like what we want. Like you notice in the front, you can see that the bar has like a curve to it. But that bar, the bar structure originally was from the old club. So that's what they looked like. But what the club didn't have was the tables. So we made the tables kind of match the bar. So if you see the, the bar goes in and out, we made the tables and we, we made the tables ourselves. We cut them so that it matches kind of the bar. So we did a lot of utilitarian type things that we thought would look good, but based on what was already currently there. We used to have pool tables back here when we took the pool tables out because people were basically just playing beer pong on them. <laughs> we said, well, we found a place that makes custom beer pong tables. And, so we put our logo on them and has like the nice holes to put your, you know, has the drink washing, the ball washing glass and a place to put the ping pong balls. So we come in here a lot and people like to play it. So once again, find out what people want and give it to them. It's not a big secret. I don't know if there's an international regulation on beer pong tables, but I think ours might come as close as they can. This is a, over here we have shuffleboard. It's our bar shuffleboard. It's a game that I grew up playing when, when I was, brought to a bar. <laughs> I've seen it all over the place, but a lot of bars in the north will have this kind of in their back room. And it's basically, it's bar shuffleboard. There's like a, a sand you put on it and you slide it and you have to be like pretty accurate and you just try and get it as close to the edge without coming off. Kind of like the old flick football game that people used to play. It's something that we felt a lot of people would like and so we put it in and it seems to be popular. Everyone's like, oh, it's, it's like my hidden gem, but hopefully it's not too hidden and hopefully a lot of people find it. I think the secret is having a classic feel, having, you know, no one's not gonna wanna go to your neighborhood bar. I mean, that's what it is. So I feel like always staying true to the vision of, and when it comes to like, well, should we do this or should we do this or should we get fancy? Like, well, what's the person that's gonna live here? You know, do they wanna come into like a techno night? Probably not. So just having good music and a jukebox and cold beer and great drinks and certain good trained people. I could say that I, I, I really enjoyed journalism, but it was never like a passion. And I, I don't even really think that the restaurant industry is my passion, but I think that my relationship with people is kind of more in line with the front man as, you know, the nice guy. Everyone's like, hey, quickie, hey, quickie, you know? That's my passion is like my relationships with people and giving them something they want. I mean, I, everyone loves going out to eat and going to a bar and having a drink. So I want to give, my passion is giving them a place to go that they're going to feel they want to go. So it's like, you know, find out what people want and give it to them. I mean, a lot of our success has to do with our employees and they're, you know, they're known as, you know, good people and everyone everyone should get, come here and they get treated well and like they're a regular even if it's your first time I hope that you feel like you're a regular and then our, our regulars are just they're here all the time 
and they're treated like family. We've had times like where we've had a Thanksgiving dinner like for like all of our regulars and all these people come in, we close the bar and you know have like a Thanksgiving dinner for everybody, especially if they can't get back to their families and such. I mean, our main goal is to continue to serve the community. It's the main goal is to be what Sidebar is. I don't see it. I don't see us like making a radical change. Come in, try it, and you'll be coming back, hopefully more than once a week. What a full, exciting day. And we didn't get stuck in even one traffic jam. We just made Atlanta history. I'm already looking forward to our next adventure together here on Georgia Detours. I'm Allie Hill. See you again soon.